One, two, one, two. Okay, okay let's uh, hit play. You can see a picture of a fox there, so. Uh, okay. Uh, and Okay, so uh, I'm James Reeves. I believe I've already been introduced. Um, I've been working with Clojure for about seven or eight years. Uh, I've written a few libraries, um, around about 60. <laughs> and I'm the lead developer of Ring. Uh, I'm currently working as freelance, a uh, freelance contractor in London. Um, and I'll be available for hire from the new year. So that's just a little plug. Uh, <laughs> So this is a talk about um, the upcoming asynchronous handlers in Ring 1.6, uh, and that's currently in beta. I think it's like beta 14 or something like that now. Um, the release candidate is expected sometime early next year. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to ask, well, what problem are we solving, right? So um, we're going to add asynchronous handlers to a Ring, but, but, what, but why? why? Why are we doing this? Uh, so, if we sort of take a look at uh, this diagram, which sort of like indicates like a normal threaded um, uh, web application, uh, the uh, grey parts are the uh, where the threads are idle, the red parts are where the threads are busy, and a lot of threaded web applications tend to have a lot of waiting around, right? So you might have some burst of CPU, but you're either waiting around on the uh, 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 the request or the response or a database application. Um, uh, and ideally, we don't want this, okay? We want fewer idle threads. Uh, excuse me, my, my voice is uh, going, so I will just grab a drink of water, otherwise I will be croaking by uh, uh, minute 15. Um, so we want fewer idle threads, and fewer idle threads is essentially the same thing as saying we want performance, okay? So asynchronous handlers or are pretty much a purely performance-based um, thing. We, we want them to make things faster. Um, with one caveat, uh, asynchronous handlers also mean that we can have future closed script support. Because closed script is in JavaScript, and JavaScript doesn't have blocking I.O. Um, or threads. It does everything asynchronously. So if in some future version of Ring we want to support closed script, um, we need asynchronous handlers anyway. Um, but primarily, in the short term, we're doing it for performance. Uh, so uh, uh, here we have our threads again. And ideally, we want something like this, right? So we want to um, uh, take the blocks where we're uh, doing work and push them into smaller threads. Um, so, so we're using fewer threads. Each thread is now um, doing multiple things at once. And the way we're going to... Uh, so this is a like, close-up of, of what a thread might be doing. We've got um, the uh, re re uh, request being received. Um, we're doing some parsing of the request, something which uh, takes in the raw sort of bytes and turns it into something useful. Uh, then usually we sort of wait for the database or wait for some external service. Uh, then we create the response and send the response. Um, usually, like, <coughs> the waiting for internal services uh, takes a majority of what we're doing with web application. Obviously, it sort of changes uh, depending on what we're doing. Um, but a lot of the time, uh, waiting for the database or waiting for an external service takes a um, significant portion of what we're doing, um, particularly in the case of APIs and things like that. Um, and asynchronous handlers um, are about removing this part, right? Removing um, internal uh, uh, I.O. or internal blocking I.O. Um, but what they don't deal with is um, external blocking I.O. So um, asynchronous hand handlers solve one problem, um, but they don't solve non-blocking I.O. Um, so so th this is a sort of small roadmap here. Um, we're currently, the current stable version of Ring is 1.5, and uh, it uses synchronous handlers, and it has done since um, pre-1.0. Um, and synchronous handlers are just functions, right? Um, you take in a request, uh, you wait around, you block, and then you return a response. Um, in 1.6, uh, we're going for asynchronous handlers. Um, what we're not doing is non-blocking I.O. Um, that's a future uh, optimization. Um, but, it, but it's better than nothing, right? We've, we, we've taken one big step forward in terms of performance. Um, just because we haven't uh, gone all the way doesn't mean that we're not going to see some benefits. Um, and I'll talk more about why non-blocking I.O. hasn't made this release 
um, later on in the talk. Uh, okay, so now we've decided what we're going to do. Uh, we next have to decide on syntax, right? We need to decide how we're going to do it. Uh, and usually, when we're thinking about things in Clojure, um, there's a scale between simple um, to performant. Um, things that are simple tend to be things that are not as performant as things that are complex, right? And the classic example here is um, uh, immutable versus mutable, right? Mutable data structures are complex, but they're also very performant, um, whereas simple data structures uh, are immutable, but maybe not so performant. And we sort of see this um, pattern again and again um, with threads versus callbacks. Threads tend to be very simple to think about. Um, callbacks tend to be very, very uh, uh, complex but performant. Um, transducers are probably more complex than using raw sequence operations. Um, so we have this kind of uh, 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 transition between things that are simple and things that are performant. Um, and ideally, we want to start off with things that are simple. If we can get away with things that are simple, we want to start at this end, and then when we need to, transition to this end. Right? We don't want to start off with things that are performant, because premature optimization is the root of all evil, uh, or at least in 97% of cases. Um, but we have this gap. Right? Um, we, we need some way of transitioning between the simple stuff we've created um, into something more um, complex. Um, so how, how, how do we bridge this gap? How do we go from something um, simple to something that's performant? Uh, in the case of um, uh, in the case of mutable to immutable, um, closure provides transients. So the, this is a simple um, piece of closure code, uh, and this is a more performant piece of closure code where we're using transients. Um, so we're just wrapping the um, vectors here uh, in a transient. We're using the exclamation mark um, version of conj, and then we're setting it back to persistent. And crucially, the shape of the code hasn't changed, right? Um, we've added um, additional functions, but the same, the structure is pretty much the same. And we can see this pattern um, in Clojure a lot. So if you've done any work with Core.a sync, you know it has go blocks, but it also has threaded operations. And you can transition between Go and Thread um, pretty much by replacing one with the other. Um, similarly, you have transducers. Um, and trans transducers follow the same pattern as a threaded um, uh, section of seek operations. Right? You can sort of almost map from one to the other. I mean, there is some um, change, but uh, uh, we want to keep the overall shape of the code. And crucially, going from simple to going from something that's simple to something that's performant should be easy, right? Um, and the shape of the code should remain the same. And if we can get a transition between something that's simple to something that's performant, that's as easy as possible to make, then people are less likely to choose a performance option. They're less, less likely to pre-optimize because they know they can just go to something more performant um, in a very easy step. Um, and that's one of the goals that we wanted to do with um, Ring. We wanted to get something where you can start off with simple synchronous handlers and then transition to asynchronous handlers when you need performance. We don't want you to start off by saying, uh, we absolutely need this performance, so we're going to start off with asynchronous handlers. Ideally, you want to start off with something synchronous, and then when you start to run into problems, transition to something that's asynchronous. Uh, so, so this is just a um, simple ring response. Um, so it's a map. Uh, we have a status, headers, uh, body. And then this is just a handler. Uh, we take in the request, we ignore it, and then we return the response. Okay? So uh, if any of you have written any ring, this should be uh, familiar to you. Uh, so from a sort of diagrammatic point of view, uh, it looks kind of like this. Uh, we have the request, the handler, we have, have a response. Uh, so the response is returned. Um, but uh, all functions also have a third output. Um, so as well as their arguments and their return value, um, functions can also throw um, exceptions. Right? And that's an alternative way of getting out of a function, returning some data from the function um, uh, without going through the return value. But it's still blocking. Right? Um, you'll still 
um, blocking until the function either throws or returns. Um, so we want an asynchronous version of this. Okay? And we can't use the return value uh, because the return value blocks. So we need some other way of getting the information out. And the usual way of doing this, uh, and in fact the way that asynchronous ring uh, uses this, is to use um, callbacks. So rather than having um, a response, we have a callback called respond. And rather than having throw, we have a callback called raise, which raises things asynchronously. We actually still have to keep throw around because you can't tell a function not to throw exceptions, right? All functions can potentially throw exceptions. Um, we can throw away the return value, but we still need to catch exceptions. They're, they're not something that we can ignore. So there are actually two ways of um, uh, throwing exceptions in asynchronous handlers. You've got throw and you've also got raise. Um, and raise can uh, be called after the function has ended, whereas throw is, uh, it can only be called whilst the function is being executed. Uh, so, okay, so how does it look, look in practice, right? So this is just a high-level diagram. What's the actual code look like? Uh, so this is the synchronous uh, handler, which you saw before, uh, and this is the asynchronous handler. Um, so all we've done here is we've added two new arguments, um, one for um, respond, one for raise, uh, and then instead of just returning the response, um, we pass it to the um, uh, callback. So, so this is the main abstraction which we're introducing um, in ring 1.6, this three-argument form. Um, and the nice thing about having different arities, about having three arguments and one, one argument, is that Clojure in Java can dispatch on arity. So we can um, have the same function have both an asynchronous mode and a synchronous mode. So we can do something like this. So this handler function um, has both a synchronous part and an asynchronous part. So we can use the same function um, in two different ways. Right? This, is, this function can be used with a um, synchronous um, adapter or an asynchronous adapter, and it'll just do exactly the same thing. Um, and this is important because it means that all our other abstractions can sort of build off this. Um, we can still use the same handlers, um, and we'll see later we can still use the same middleware. Uh, so this is just returning a response. Um, if we want to raise an exception, uh, there's something similar. So the synchronous version, we just throw the exception. Uh, and the asynchronous version, we pass the exception to this callback. Uh, so what about middleware? Uh, well, middleware actually works out sort of fairly similarly. Uh, this is an uh, example of middleware. Um, you can see it's got... Uh, it returns a function, or it should return a function. Uh, it's slightly, uh, the function part has actually gone missing, uh, which I didn't notice when I did the slides. Um, but if you imagine that a function is there, uh, and these are the parts of the function, um, uh, for a synchronous um, part, we uh, pass the request to this function foo request, which changes the request in some way, uh, and then we pass it to the handler. So this should be sort of fairly familiar. Um, foo requests could be anything. We could be associating a new header. We could be um, parsing cookies. We could be doing something like that. Uh, the asynchronous part is very similar. We just have two additional arguments. So when we're modifying the request, not a lot changes between um, synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, when we're modifying the response, it gets a little bit more difficult because um, with a synchronous handler, the response is returned in the return value. With an asynchronous handler, um, it's got this respond. So what we do is um, uh, create a new function uh, and then just wrap the respond. So we're passing a new respond function. Maybe this is a little bit clearer if we use um, compose. So if we use comp, which uh, Chris mentioned yesterday. Um, so in this case, we're composing foo response with respond. So you can kind of see that um, it has a very similar kind of mechanism to um, uh, here where we're composing the foo response with the return value from the handler. So this gives us middleware which can alter the response um, and the request. And of course, we can choose whether or not to execute the handler. So the asynchronous version um, of middleware works in the same way or has the same capabilities as a synchronous version of middleware. And crucially, we can use the same function um, 
to modify both synchronous and asynchronous versions. So the advantages of uh, this particular design is that it's, um, well, first of all, it's, it's, first of all, it's performant. Um, because dispatching on Arity is a compiler time um, uh, structure, at least if you're not using apply. So it's very, very fast. It's the same mechanism that transducers use. Um, so you're not uh, uh, checking uh, the response or uh, for, you're not checking to see whether it's synchronous or asynchronous each time. That's all sort of handled at compile time, depending on how many arguments you use to call the handler to begin with. Um, it's also backwards compatible. Um, we can have handlers which dispatch on one arity, which is synchronous, or three arity, which is asynchronous. Uh, as we saw, middleware works the same. So we can apply the same middleware to handlers, um, and it'll work the same way. Um, and we're also using, introducing no exotic syntax. So we're introducing no additional macros, or no um, deferreds, or anything like that. Um, we're just using callbacks, um, which are natively supported by Ring. Right? It's, it's, all, it's all just um, uh, functions being passed in. Uh, so let's look at an example. Uh, so this is a, uh, a small sort of piece of code. It's using um, Composure up here, um, defining some routes. Uh, then we've got the handler, which takes the routes and uses this wrap default um, middleware. Uh, uh, and then we run the handler using the um, Jetty adapter. Uh, so how does this, so if we wanted to transition this to asynchronous, uh, what would it look like? Like what work would we have to do? Uh, it turns out that's what we have to do. Right? We, we, we just add this async true onto the end of Jetty, and instead of calling the handler with one argument, it calls it with three arguments. Uh, and, and then everything else will work, right? And then this will be sort of an asynchronous um, uh, piece of code. Um, I say it's asynchronous, um, but we're not actually doing anything which is asynchronous, right? We're, we're just returning a string. So we're not doing anything interesting, even though it's a we're using asynchronous handler, it's actually going to have the same performance as a regular handler because we're not we're not doing any sort of asynchronous I.O. in this example. Um, so let's take a closer look at this, this root up here. Uh, so this is a root. Um, we're just returning a static string. Um, and Composure um, uh, will take a string. Um, if, you ha if you haven't used it, Composure will take a string and turn it into a valid um, ring response. Uh, and similarly, you can, instead of just returning the um, uh, raw string, you can also return a function. And if Composure gets a function returned, um, it expects it to have to essentially be like a handler. It's not quite a handler because it still allows you to return um, strings and things. Um, so it's like like a kind of partial handler. It will um, take the return value and automatically convert it into a map. So we can do something like this where we where we've got the request. And of course, with asynchronous um, code, we can um, add the respond and raise. So suddenly now we've got the capability of um, um, doing asynchronous code. But we can keep all of the code which we don't need to make performant the same. And we can target the parts which we know are slow. So we can do some benchmarks. We can say, OK, well, this part is slow. We know it's slow because it's accessing the database. Um, and the database is taking a long time to respond. Uh, if we want to make this more performant, particularly in the case of an API, which is being hit um, many times, uh, then we can target a particular route and um, convert it into an asynchronous thing. So instead of using a synchronous database handler, we can use one with a callback. Um, so for example, uh, maybe we have a database function or something which, uh, which we call get name asynchronously. Um, and uh, we pass it a function. Um, at some point, that, function, that callback function will come back, uh, and it'll give us a name. Uh, and then we can respond. So, so this. Um, this function or, or this root can actually stop, it can return, and then at some later date, um, this get name asynchronously will call this callback and we will get the response. Okay, so, so that shows you how um, we can asynchronously respond to, uh, um, uh, 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 like generate a, a full response, right? Um, but sometimes we want a streaming response. We want a response which we put in the first line and then we uh, maybe put in some more data, particularly if you're doing long polling um, or if you're um, using some kind of streaming uh, uh, sort of chat system or uh, sending events to the uh, browser in some way. Um, so uh, uh, let me just take a drink because my throat's going. Joy is being on the underground and catching colds. So in 
uh, Ring 1.5 and um, all versions previous, um, the response body can be one of these four things. And these four things are a fixed set of values. So it can either be a string, a seek, a file, or an input stream. Um, and these are fixed because when Ring 1.0 came out, uh, we didn't actually have protocols. Like Ring predates protocols, um, even though it seems like protocols have been around for, for a while, uh, Ring has been around for a little bit longer. Um, but now we do have protocols uh, in 1.6. We're uh, taking all of those things and putting them in a streamable response body protocol. So rather than having a case statement in our adapter, um, we have a streamable response body um, protocol which handles all of that for us. Um, and it looks like this. Uh, so uh, the streamable response body protocol has this single method, write body to stream. Um, we've got the body, uh, we've got the output stream, um, which we're going to write to, and it also passes in the response. Um, this is important for things like strings where we need to know the char set of what we're writing to the output stream. So uh, when I initially wrote this, it didn't have that three arguments. It just had the body and the output stream. And then I realized that uh, uh, we needed the character encoding from the re response in order to figure out how to write the string to the output stream. Uh, right, so that's the protocol. Uh, if we want to use that to create a streaming response, um, we can just rarefy it. So we can do something like this. Um, so this is a handler. Uh, it's an asynchronous handler. We're using respond. We're um, responding with a, uh, a, a, a response map. And the body is a streamable response body we're rarefying. Um, and then we can just use this function to get the output stream to write it and close it. Um, it needs to be explicitly closed. Um, because it needs to be explicitly closed, um, we can take the stream, pass it to an asynchronous handler, and the asynchronous handler can um, perform multiple writes and then decide when to close it. And the uh, response itself isn't closed until we explicitly close the stream. Um, so we can use with open as well to make sure we close it um, uh, if there are any exceptions. Uh, so this, this allows us to write um, bits of data at a time and bits of data asynchronously to the response. Um, so this shows us how we can use um, asynchronous um, handlers uh, and asynchronous responses with blocking I.O. Um, but what I haven't touched on, um, aside from uh, earlier on, is uh, uh, non-blocking I.O. Uh, so I mentioned at the beginning that non-blocking I.O. wouldn't make Ring 1.6. Uh, and you might be saying, well, why not? Why not include like, the whole kit and caboodle? Uh, and it turns out there are two main problems with this. Uh, the first problem is it would break backwards compatibility. Uh, and that's because the request body requests, uh, expects a blocking input stream. And if we change this blocking input stream to something else, uh, all of the existing code would break. Um, because although we can have more, or we can overload the response body with more values, because we can just keep on adding more types that uh, it's responding to, we can't really change what's coming into the handlers without breaking all of the existing handlers, right? If, if we suddenly change the input stream to some non-blocking I.O. Um, buffer instead, um, nothing would work. Uh, so, that's, so the first problem is we need to break backwards compatibility, and that means moving from um, ring 1 point something to ring 2.0. Uh, and the second problem is every Java web server handles non-blocking I.O. differently. Like, I haven't been able to find any common thread between them. They all use different classes in different ways. Um, so we need to write our own protocol around that um, in order to sort of harm harmonize that. And it's because uh, Java has a non-blocking I.O. in its standard library, but it doesn't have a released standard that I'm aware of for um, web server non-blocking I.O. Um, I believe it's still in um, uh, uh, draft form by now. Um, but nothing supports that. Um, so we'd need to write our own, effectively, a wrapper around it, which would support Netty and um, under, under uh, uh, flow and things like that. Uh, under toast, sorry, sorry. And Rapidoid, which is another um, web server which has come out as well. And Jetty does something different um, entirely. Uh, OK, so uh, we've done synchronous handlers, uh, asynchronous handlers. Um, we need to move to Ring 2.0 um, to do non-blocking I.O. Um, so, so that's the kind of roadmap. We're, we're not there with Ring 2.0 yet, and Ring 2.0 will probably have other things like namespace keywords. Um, but once 
1.6 is released, um, I'll uh, 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 release several sort of draft um, documents and get community input, and uh, uh, everyone can have their uh, two cents uh, uh, on, on that process. Okay, uh, I think I've finished with about five minutes to go, so uh, uh, that's the end of the talk. Excellent. Thank you very much, James. Uh, yes, using Ring, you usually end up uh, uh, finishing a lot sooner than I normally do when I'm doing my project, so it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's good that you finished early with your talk. Any questions for James about Ring, uh, as asynchronous Ring? Oh, there we go. Hi there, James. Um, just quickly, with the um, multipolarities for the um, asynchronous and asynchronous handlers, um, thinking about the migration path for that, is there any way that... Um, Ring can, for example, determine whether a, a handler is asynchronous or synchronous, or is it a case of you have to go through and migrate all of your handlers to an asynchronous handler if the top-level flag's set? Uh, so, if you're using a um, uh, routing library like Composure, um, then your handlers will, like, you'll automa that'll automatically happen. So, if you're so if you're using Composure, if you update to the new Composure. Um, then it will, instead of producing handlers with just one arity, it will produce them with two arities as well. Um, so if you're using Composure, it'll work out of the box. Um, if you're using um, other uh, routing frameworks, then um, they will have to uh, uh, implement this, but potentially it could just be as painless. Um, if you're writing your handlers manually, then you do need to go through and change them. Um, but hopefully you won't be doing that um, very much. Cool. Oh, yes. A question from one of our other speakers. When there is more traffic than we can deal with, in the synchronous world, we can use thread pools and back pressure to deal with the problem. How does it work in the asynchronous world? Uh, it's entirely up to the, uh, how the adapter is um, implemented. Um, so, so that's just a detail for the adapter to um, handle. Um, Ring doesn't really have anything to say about that. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yes. Uh, what's the need for the kind of distinction between throw and raise? Like if there's a bad citizen of, the, of an async handler world that throws, what, uh, does, does Ring itself catch those exceptions and deal with them or uh, what happens there? Uh, yeah, so the, the reason why there's a distinction is because you can only throw an exception um, and expect it to be caught whilst the function is um, being executed, right? If your function um, returns immediately and expects the res uh, response to be handled in a callback, then your try-catch around the function won't catch the um, exception if the callback throws something, right? If, if a callback throws an exception, it won't be caught by the thing which is calling the handler. Um, which is why we need raise um, to handle exceptions which might occur in a callback. Um, and we, so we do need to do a bit of work in catching any exceptions and then explicitly raising them. But it means that we can still uh, trickle exceptions up. Like um, middleware can still handle um, exceptions, like wrap stack trace, for instance, in the um, Ring uh, uh, development um, library. It will trap both. Um, exceptions thrown and exceptions raised asynchronously. Any more? Any more? Oh, one at the back there. Uh, were you tempted to provide a two arity version of the handler? Uh, so, we, sorry? A two arity version, which, do, which doesn't have the raise. For the case where you know you're not going to raise something. Uh, no, because it's easier just to ignore the raise function. Okay. Um, than it is to, because then all middleware would have to deal with three different um, things rather than just two different things. Okay. Um, so it's, it actually create more work. Um, it's easier just to put a, an underscore where the raise is and just ignore it, or, or, ju or just to pa pass it directly through. All right, thanks. Any more questions about uh, what James was talking about, or anything, or any of the 60 libraries did you say you'd written? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of them are very, very small. Um, okay, but but powerful, just like closure. There we go. <laughs>
Uh, excellent. Uh, well, if there are no more questions, uh, thanks very much, James. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.